Well, we'll go ahead and get started with our next presenter. So it is a joy to introduce Jen Gunter. I'll tell you a little bit about Jen. She is originally from Atlanta, Georgia. She has a bachelor's in English and she completed the MA in yoga studies in 2016. She's a lecturer at USC where she teaches both yoga and yoga therapy. She's a licensed massage therapist and she holds many, many yoga certifications with special interest in the therapeutic benefits of acro yoga. And she integrates her unique skill set of yoga therapy, bodywork, and assisted stretching in her private practice, Southern Sun Wellness. I want to tell you a little story about practicum when uh, because we our students this past semester worked with both undergraduate uh, LMU students who suffer from a lot of stress and anxiety and depression as most uh, the majority of undergrads in university nationwide do. They also worked with seniors in a residential living center. And uh, Jen had a patient who came to us, our client, who was 91 years old. When she showed up, she said, I'm just here because I like to learn things, but I don't think you can help me. And she had a lot of medical conditions. And when Jen first saw her, her blood pressure was, what was it, Jen? It was 200 or something, 190? Uh, yeah, the, I did at some point early on see 200 plus in, in her blood pressure. It was so high and I was saying to Jen, we have to be careful with this and the, the um, client, the woman said, I've been on medication for uh, over, you know, for years and it's always like that. My doctors just said that's the way it is. There's nothing you can do. I think it was four sessions when it came to normal or was it, I think it was four sessions when her blood pressure was normal and she said, she came out and she said to me, all the other yoga teachers talk too much about the birds and the flowers outside and everything like that. In here, I get to learn about myself. In yoga therapy, that's what yoga therapy is. It teaches you how to know yourself. And I thought that was just so beautiful in four sessions that Jen was able to convey that. It's really, really amazing work. And this woman said that it, uh, the work that all of, all of the students did at Fountainview was the most constructive uh, program that they had there since she'd been living there. It was just great work. So um, Jen is a master of physical practices of yoga and she is an acro yoga teacher trainer and she's also deeply committed to the academic study of yoga, particularly the study of Sanskrit texts and she was a teaching assistant during her graduate studies at Loyola. And she embodies the balance of knowledge and physical practice, and thus she receives the Yana Yoga and Hatha Yoga Award. And uh, let me escape from here. Jen and I have talked quite a bit that acro yoga has always seemed like this separation. It was like the acro yoga and then the yoga therapy. And Jen has found a brilliant way to put them together. So I will hand the stage over to Jen and she's going to talk to us about that. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that very, very sweet introduction. I um, am very, very, very honored to be here tonight and to share um, truly what is I, a, an honor and a passion of mine to share. Um, and so I will go ahead and share screen and pull up my presentation. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit something differently than what I'd initially planned. Just because what I'm speaking about is such an embodied practice, I would like to honor the fact that on a five minute break, not all of us might have gotten to stand up and move enough. So I am going to start with a little bit of embodied practice for those of you who are willing and able and feel comfortable standing up to do so. So it'll only take a, a couple minutes. I'd like to start 
uh, this out. I like to start my uh, classes with my students this way too. So if you're comfortable doing so, stand up. Don't worry, no one's looking at you on the camera. And I'm also partially doing this for me to get, get out some jitters as well. So I appreciate you embodying with me if you feel comfortable doing so. So start by shaking your right arm. Shake, shake, shake your right arm. Shake it high, shake it low in front of you, behind you. And then shake your left arm. Shake it out in space. We're not doing the hokey pokey. I promise I'll get to the, the meat and bones of this presentation soon, but I want to honor our bodies. And shake your right leg, please. If you need to hold on to something for balance, you can do that. Shake that right leg. And then same thing with your left leg. Shake, shake, shake it out. And this has nothing to do with acro yoga. I'm, like I said, I'm just honoring our bodies. And then shake everything, shake everything. Try not to bump into any furniture if you're near anything. Shake, shake, shake it all out. Shake it even more out, shake your hips, your head, everything, and then stop. And then plant both of your feet on the ground, feet hips distance apart, please. Close your eyes and take a moment to, I like to call this shaking up the snow globe to the students that I work with at USC. And we really uh, use that a lot in our practice recently. And when you're ready, please go ahead and open your eyes and you can take your seat again. Thank you for um, sharing a minute or two of movement practice with me. So um, tonight we're gonna talk about acro yoga. And I, before I get started, I do want to share one thing that one of my students at USC said um, regarding uh, yoga coming into our yoga class at the start of the semester, uh, or well, excuse me, finishing at the, uh, this semester. He said, uh, you know, um, I thought that I was signing up for a class that was all about stretching. And it was that, but really it was a whole lot more. And I want you to, I want to invite, um, I have some pictures of acro yoga that I'll share tonight. And a lot of people look at the pictures and say, oh, that looks fun. Or, oh, that looks like circus or contortion. But I invite you, for those of you who haven't embodied acro yoga before, to trust me in that, uh, yes, it's all those things, and also there's so much more as well. Um, and, uh, and, and there's dynamic approaches and there's more calm, quiet therapeutic approaches. And so we'll talk about a lot of these tonight. Um, so I will go forward. Uh, of course, before beginning, I do want to honor um, Dr. Chapel, Dr. Fazio, um, Nurinjan and David, Amy, all, all of you all at LMU who have been so helpful and so just so supportive as well as um, our whole cohort of postgraduate yoga studies has been amazing to work with and it's truly been an honor and I am truly grateful for this experience. So what I have here is a, is a balance beam, as you can see. And on one side, we've got yoga therapy. And on the other side, we've got acro yoga. And at the bottom, um, I will talk about um, what I see being kind of common ground between the two and how we can utilize that in a therapeutic sense. So I'll talk a little bit about yoga therapy. Um, for those of y'all who are not very familiar, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what acro yoga looks like um, currently. And then below uh, the foundation, I'll talk more about how acro yoga can be used as a therapeutic, not replacement for yoga therapy. I'm not, I'm not suggesting acro yoga be a replacement for any modality. I'm gonna talk for, about uh, other related modalities. I'm not suggesting yoga therapy, I mean, excuse me, acro yoga replace any of those, but instead discuss how it can be a therapeutic addition to yoga therapy or other modalities. So yoga therapy, there's just like there's many different approaches to yoga, there's many different approaches to yoga therapy. The International Association of Yoga Therapists defines yoga therapy as the process of empowering individuals to progress towards improved health and well-being through the application and teachings of the practices of yoga. 
George Feuerstein, who many of you master's uh, students or graduates are familiar with his work, um, his phenomenal work in uh, yoga philosophy, uh, I think gives a very beautiful definition in, in saying, whereas yoga is primarily concerned with personal transcendence, yoga therapy aims at more of a holistic, whole body, whole person treatment. Both approaches, however, share an understanding of the human being as an integrated mind-body system, which can function optimally only when there's a state of dynamic balance. And we talk about this a lot in yoga therapy, um, the sense of homeostasis for uh, being the most healthful state. Um, and so below I've got a photo of uh, many different approaches and styles of doing uh, yoga therapy. Dr. Bhavanani on the bottom left, uh, we had the, I had the joy and pleasure of learning from him along with yoga, with, excuse me, along with Lori about uh, all the work that he's done in yoga therapy um, in, in balancing uh, the, the approaches of yoga meets yoga therapy and Eastern Western approaches. And you also see yoga therapy a lot in other more, far more secular, um, different approaches of yoga therapy. So there's, there's many styles, there's many approaches, um, and know that it's all geared towards balance. So what is balance? Like what, how does, what do you mean by that exactly? Yoga offers, uh, yoga therapy offers many frameworks from which to define a place of balance from the gunas of Rajasattva Tamas with Rajas being fiery, uh, overly fiery, Tamas being more um, mellow, grounded, heavy. Uh, Sattva is the place in the middle. It's the place of balance that uh, yoga therapy um, pushes us towards. And then we've got from the koshas, attention to all five sheaths in order to create a sense of balance. So there's, there's lots of terminology and there's lots of language around how to create balance in one's life and in one's uh, mind, body, spirit. Uh, and in, in the spirit of integrating the wisdom of both Eastern and Western approaches, many yoga therapists use uh, what's called the biopsychosocial model. Uh, it was initially the biopsycho excuse me, the, bio, the biopsychosocial spiritual model. It was originally the biopsychosocial model introduced by George Engel in 1977 and has uh, since then been uh, evolved and expanded to include spiritual health as well. And uh, the below quote is from a um, study that looked at yoga therapy and how yoga therapy uh, can be utilized to, uh, in this framework of the biopsychosocial spiritual model. And it says, uh, this, this is a quote from the um, abstract. It says, physical systems activated through yoga practice include the musculoskeletal, cardiopulmonary, autonomic nervous system, and endocrine functioning. Psychological benefits include enhanced coping, self-efficacy, and positive moods. Spiritual mechanisms can be understood within a Western medical model, include acceptance and mindful awareness. But where's the social? It, it, this article does go on to expand upon the social and in identifying how when someone is doing a, a, a practice of, towards self-improvement, the relationships uh, follow suit. However, I would like to introduce acro yoga as a way of um, bringing even more mindfulness to the uh, social aspect of the biocycle social spiritual model. Um, but I will address acro yoga as it pertains to all of these realms. And I, I want to, I, I have a few key quotes that I think are worth sharing um, that I'll kind of intersperse. And this quote is from um, Desika Char, who's oftentimes called the father of, um, excuse me, the, the father of yoga therapy. And he says that the success of yoga does not lie in the ability to perform postures. Sorry, I've got uh, something blocking. But in um, the way that uh, positive, it positively changes the way we live our life and relationships. So um, key, I invite you to keep that in mind as we go forward and explore acro yoga. So acro yoga is a blend of acrobatics meets yoga. Um, and I'm going to first start with two of the most um, common prominent approaches to acro yoga. However, know that there are many others. 
Um, and I'll, then I'll share a little bit of terminology before I approach it from a more therapeutic standpoint. So the, the style in which I have been trained in acro yoga is called acroyoga.org. It was founded uh, a little over 10 years ago. Um, and uh, the definition of acro yoga according to this uh, style is acro yoga combines the fitness and play of acrobatics, the healing and movement of therapeutics, and the balance and connection of yoga. So according to acroyoga.org, there's two broad approaches to practicing acro yoga, a more solar approach, which does have the more um, physical challenge and the more acrobatic aspects, but there's also a lunar side that's a little bit less often discussed, and it is more centered around um, therapeutics in the sense of offering physical therapeutics, or uh, there's also elements of Thai massage. Um, and I think that uh, most of these pictures that I've included today are my own. And so I, uh, I chose these pictures because on the, on the far left, uh, you see me basing a uh, prominent LA yoga teacher, Yancey uh, Schwartz, fantastic yoga teacher. He incorporates a lot of yoga philosophy in his classes. Uh, longtime yoga practitioner, and he can do this on his own without me, but he uh, chose to try it more acrobatically on my feet. Um, whereas if you look in the photo on the right, um, the therapeutic approach to acro yoga doesn't have to be anything flashy or crazy or very physical at all. There's so, so much um, benefit offered just to sitting back to back with someone. It can be so simple, either meditating back to back with someone or doing some gentle twists. Uh, there doesn't have to be a lot of this frenetic, um, playful energy, though that's certainly fun too. Um, the, the therapeutics can be truly this simple. And for anyone who's never done this practice, I encourage you to try it with someone who you love and trust of just sitting back to back. And um, I, I think you might find it to be quite grounding as well. Um, I want to honor too an, another style of acro yoga that I think truly um, embodies a lot of the yoga philosophy. I'm not trained in it, so I can't speak from firsthand experience but I do have a lot of respect for teachers who are trained in Acro Yoga Montreal. They incorporate a lot of dance and very mindful, beautiful movement with their um, practice. And I, I took this from their website. It says Acro Yoga combines the acrobatic, combines acrobatic concepts, but a yogic consciousness. They utilize the application of bandhas, drishti, ujjayi breath, and vinyasa flow and synchronizing movement with breath into a partner acrobatic practice and they incorporate a lot of dance um, and fuse acro yoga with dance aesthetics but they really are brilliant in how you can see even though I, i've only practiced little tiny bits of acro yoga montreal that they really emphasize being in the moment and being in balance with one with another person in in the um in their practice of acro yoga um, a quick note about some common acro yoga terminology before we move on. Um, the first thing that I truly appreciate about acro yoga is clear communication. The, above and beyond, uh, no matter who you do acro yoga with, the word down means down. No questions asked. The minute someone says down, everybody stops. And that helps keep the practice safe. And that clear communication creates a, a system of trust and honoring one another's experience that is really um, beautiful. Uh, below that, I also offered the base flyer spotter. So like I said, acro yoga is not necessarily acrobatic. Sometimes it can be on the ground, but when it is acrobatic in nature and there is a person in the air, the base is the person or people who are connected to the ground. The flyer is the person in the air. You can see from uh, Yoga Day, I think that was Yoga Day 2016, in which I taught an acro yoga class at LMU. Uh, the flyer is up in the air. And then the spotter, which is by far and away the most important role in creating A, physical safety, but also B, commu clear communication between the base and flyer uh, are 
uh, they, there are two spotters pictured in that uh, photo. And then, like I said, I, there's many, there's ambiguity in this phrase and in this term of what partner yoga means and whether that's the same as acro yoga or not. I did a series of interviews with three women who have all um, done acro yoga before or are acro teachers. Um, and they all had some different definitions of partner yoga. So I offer two definitions um, of partner yoga, one being um, uh, a practice in which two people mindfully connecting in postures and it's, it's focused on the relationship between those two people. Or uh, partner yoga can also be two or more people practicing postures together in which there's no, uh, um, nobody goes in the air, everyone remains on the ground. And usually it's partner stretching. Um, there's no base flyer or spotter rolls. Usually people are mirroring one another in whatever they're doing. Um, and so you can see that in the, uh, the bottom photo, Lori and I weren't necessarily doing a partner yoga practice, but we were doing a partner yoga pose in which we do a balancing pose, but offer each other support through our extended hands, which helps, I help Lori balance and Lori helps me balance in that process. Um, and last but not least, the, uh, I'll talk more about this soon, but across the board in every yoga, acro yoga setting, there is consent and communication. Okay, so one other quote before I get down into um, the biopsychosocial spiritual model. Uh, this comes from Bessel van der Kolk, and he is an expert on trauma, um, and he speaks a lot to um, how important it is to um, move trauma from the body. And uh, this quote is from his book, uh, The Body Keeps Score. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying life. And so I wanna take a moment to, with this quote, honor that um, we're in an interesting time for, to talk about acro yoga because of social distancing and COVID-19. And I do want to say that everything that I'm presenting is not safe nor appropriate to do at this current time. However, once it is possible to start connecting with each other again in person, whether it's just even being able to gather, uh, I think it is also very important to honor that most of us, Bessel van der Kolk gave an excellent talk that he posted on uh, YouTube. I highly recommend everybody watching it. And he says that most all of us right now are in a state of pre-trauma because there is a lot going on beyond our control and we are uh, forced into being isolated in this time. And so that's kind of a setup for disaster for a lot of people. And I think that um, uh, it's important to honor that most, uh, many of us are, are feeling that, that distance. And I think that uh, approaching reconnecting with people mindfully, whether that's in a physical sense or in a just gathering sense, is it's important to do that mindfully and honor that um, some of us might feel a lot of fear coming up and reconnecting with other people. And I hope that um, not whether it's with acro yoga or otherwise, that we can honor that and uh, move comfortably and mindfully into connecting with each other again. So what I would like to, so we're moving down now in the presentation and what I created here was a little diagram. I'm not, I don't have enough time to speak to every point on this diagram, but I, I do want to highlight uh, the three women that I interviewed and, and their expertise on these subjects, as well as share from some of my own experience and how I plan to use that going forward. So, um, I'm going to move from biological to social to uh, psychological up and then back up to spiritual. I know that's a little bit out of order, but um, that's just the way uh, my interviews tended to flow. So let's start with the biological. What are the physical benefits that one can achieve through mindfully practicing acro yoga? One thing that I would like to point out is the ability to offer traction and inversion to the, the spine. So a lot of people that I've taught um, acro yoga to have noted how beneficial acro yoga has been for their back pain. 
a lot of people have back pain for various reasons and it's really common to um to approach back pain through a lot of methods one of which uh, actually two of which uh, can include traction and inversion usually offered through some sort of physical therapist massage therapist and or chiropractor and so on the the photo on the left illustrates a, a method of um, gravitational uh, a gravitational approach through an inversion table in which uh, you offer some spinal traction through hanging upside down on a device. Um, so in a study that I looked up there about uh, inversion tables, um, there's a study of 25 participants with uh, lumbar pain, so low back pain, where, um, and it actually was a more specific form of lumbar pain, but they were um, given lumbar traction Three sessions per three sessions per week for one month, so twelve sessions total, and their pain and the people reported pain intensity starting at the uh, averaging at the start of this study to be an eight point five, and reduced down to three point two by the end of this study, and functional disability was reduced significantly as well, and so I think um, that's an important way to to note that low low back pain can be addressed. And what I have on the right here is uh, not only the gravitational effect of inverting over someone's feet, but also offering manual support to the process. And so um, some of y'all know me and some of y'all know that this past summer I climbed uh, the tallest mountain in the continental US. Uh, and luckily I did so with a couple of other Acre Yoga people because if there's one thing that will make your back hurt, if it hasn't been already, it's carrying everything you need, food, water, shelter on your back for three days. Um, and so we would do this. We would offer each other manual and gravitational traction through this position called folded leaf. And so what's happening here is it's a, the flyer, the um, Jackie in a, a teal shirt, she is very passive. She is just hanging. You can see her arms are very relaxed. Her head is relaxed. Her body is relaxed over the base's feet. And the base is not doing that much. She's letting gravity, hence the gravitational, do most of the work, but she's very gently anchoring her hands onto Jackie's ribs and very gently, just very gently, tractioning her spine downward. And it feels amazing. And I wish I could do it to every single one of y'all. Um, if you ever see me in person, I'm happy to once COVID has passed. Um, one study that I found um, indicated that 76.6% of physical therapists specializing in nonspecific back pain reported that um, uh, using traction in their practice, 68% um, with manual methods and 45% using the tables like the one on the left. Um, but I think that I, I think that not everyone has to rush out and buy an inversion table um, with training from a, a uh, appropriate training from a yoga therapy, excuse me, from a, from an acro yoga teacher, you can um, have a lot of benefits to your back health. Uh, another way in which uh, acro yoga can be physically beneficial is in making the, the experience of certain asanas actually easier, despite what it might look like. Um, in the top left, again, that, that's my friend Annalise flying me. And in the next slide, um, Sarah Jovich, who is a longtime um, bodywork expert, and she teaches uh, massage therapy, and she is also a Chinese medicine practitioner, ex will explain why on the top left, Danyarasana, also known as bow pose, is actually a little bit easier once you have learned some basic skills in acro yoga due to the uh, foot placement on the hip and the ability to elevate the pelvis. On the top right, you'll see that is a position called three-legged down, excuse me, three-person down dog. And so what's happening here, it looks like it would be torture for the base, the person on the bottom, but it actually uh, helps experience um, downward facing dog in a different way by offering pressure on the pelvis, which uh, for a lot of people, um, creates A, a, bit, a, little, a little bit of traction in the spine, and B, offers some, a nice hamstring stretch. And then obviously the person who's back bending 
has some support in their middle back that they're arching over and again feels wonderful and in the in the bottom picture that's another class that i another special event that i taught at lmu in which everyone i didn't uh, photograph the end result but everyone is supporting each other in warrior three so warrior three alone is a very challenging balance pose you're on one foot you're extending your leg back your arms are somewhere um, depending on how you practice but when you practice warrior three with the support of others around you everyone in that circle manage to balance in warrior three through supporting each other so it's a it's a wonderful way of exploring asana to make it a little more easier than you might expect so i'd like to play a video from uh sarah who i was talking about before about um bow pose the experience of bow pose and acro yoga and um a little bit more about acro yoga so physical physically there are a number of poses that are just easier to access in a positive way when you are flying than on the ground one of the ones that i hear students noticing all this time is doing bow pose on somebody's feet yes when they can tilt you up to where it's easy for you to reach back and genuinely use your back body to get to your feet instead of like wrestling yourself into that position kind of twisting yourself to grab the foot and then doing weird twerking things to your spine and grinding your hip bones into the ground right like <laughs> soft support of the feet to tilt you up so that you can in your range of motion engage properly it just feels better i mean there's and there's a, a bunch of poses like that that you know with a base who knows how what they're doing it, you know you can just access things that are much harder um, on your own um, to do properly and then you know yeah like you said it's hard to tease apart but a lot of the, the i feel a lot of the reason that it's easier to access is the feeling of being supported by another human that sort of intangible feeling of being connected and supported i think we we are we get really isolated culturally we have this you know americans are really obsessed with being individuals and separate and there's power in that but there's also a, a loneliness and an isolation and being in physical contact with somebody with the express intention of accomplishing a goal together is spiritually connecting and psychologically soothing um, for most people you know and it's and it's meant to be playful it's not doing it in a way that's like okay and now we're doing this thing and it's really important it's like this is silly and fun like one of the rules is if you're having fun you're doing it right so it doesn't really matter if you ever achieve the pose it's like it's all about that connection and so the, the opportunity to refocus your attention on the connection is great medicine for most of us so I think that's a real advantage that Acro has over uh, individual yoga or you know any any kind of solo exercise practice. Um, so many thanks to Sarah. She's been a, a fantastic teacher of mine and co-teacher over the years. So one thing that she does highlight that I think is worth highlighting is that uh, yoga and yoga therapy evolved in a cultural context that was not nearly as individualist as our current social context, especially now amid COVID-19. So I think that that's worth honoring and also honoring that there are some people due to personal reasons or religious beliefs and so on and so forth, choose very mindfully not to engage in activities like I'm describing. And I completely honor that, but I, I uh, want to honor this as a potential healing modality for people as well. So we'll step away from the, bio the biological, the physical benefits of acro yoga. I could talk about that all 45 minutes, but I want to leave time to approach the other areas uh, as well. Um, so trust, trust and community. Um, there's not a lot of research about building trust among perfectly healthy individuals. We tend to live in a very rejectionist um, Western medical society. So um, but there is evidence supporting building trust and community among people in a healthcare setting, among uh, people in sports teams, and also um, in business settings of people who are having to collaborate on different business things. 
um, the one study that I looked at, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about mental health in a minute, but I thought that this study called um, Building a Compassionate Armor, the Journey to Develop Strength and Self-Compassion in a Group Treatment for PTSD was uh, very meaningful and kind of tied into this. So there were um, 11 women uh, underwent a group support program for, who, uh, for, for complex PTSD and patients identified three essential aspects of the group that brought uh, therapeutic help, helpful change. The first was the group itself, the community itself, the safe community in which they could um, explore uh, what was coming up for them. Uh, secondly, develop, developing a comprehensive understanding of themselves and their difficulties, and then um, experiencing their emotion and compassion from others. And, um, and they use that to prepare and, uh, for exposure-based treatment. And so I would classify ACRA Yoga, specifically for people who have experienced trauma, as an exposure-based treatment that is not something you're gonna launch into immediately, like, oh, I just had this traumatic experience. Oh, I'm gonna go try an ACRA Yoga class to, to help me deal. No, there's, there's some therapy that needs to happen before any kind of exposure-based approach, but ACRA Yoga, specifically with someone who is uh, trained in either uh, ACRA Yoga and um, trauma-informed yoga or acro yoga and some other healing modality that is equipped to handle this can be an excellent way of um, providing another a, a kind of a next step treatment. And uh, I, I will uh, talk, I interviewed two therapists about this that I will uh, play that recording soon. Um, so what you said, I, I do want to speak to trust and community as I have it photographed here. Obviously, I talked about the even just the simple practice of sitting back to back with someone, it involves a lot of trust. You can't see that person behind you. Um, but doing that in a, in a safe, supportive environment can be very profound. In the middle photo, what you see is um, uh, my buddy Sam is the flyer here. And Sam is a big old CrossFitter dude. He is not used to be pick, being picked up by another person. And he was terrified, terrified. You can see his feet are kind of flexing back. He's gripping onto Todd's arms and he's like, not sure about that experience. But I wish I had an after photo because afterwards he was glowing. He was glowing. Um, he had not experienced something like that since being a kid. And I think that that wouldn't have happened if he didn't trust the support, the, the person basing him is Todd, who's a, who's a longtime acro yoga teacher. And so it does take this element of trust and what happens uh, when we trust and stay safe um, is a really, really profound experience. Again, it doesn't have to be acrobatic. It can be just as simple as sitting back to back with someone or other very simple practices. And on the right, I just demonstrated how that similar pose can be supported through a lot of things, through a chair behind the, the base or through extra spotters to make it um, a safe environment in which uh, people can practice trust building. Also teamwork. So I'll play this video. I did this uh, workshop with um, a healthcare team at UCLA who were trying to work on teamwork and communication. And the study that I um, looked at uh, below, well, there were, there were two, but one in particular I want to mention uh, stated that communication failure is a leading cause of error in healthcare environments. And so what this study looked at was um, took a hospital and they offered teamwork uh, exercises in many ways, embodied in discussion groups and so on and so forth for their emergency room, but no additional teamwork or support training for their ICU. And uh, what they found was that the emergency room workers had far, far, far fewer errors and hiccups than the ICU. Um, after this teamwork and communication building exercise. And so I'll play, this is from the uh, healthcare team that I worked with at UCLA. So you might notice a uh, familiar pose being practiced, cat-cow on the bottom. This is called water bed. And it looks so silly, 
but once you experience it, it's phenomenal. Um, yes, and Lori said, so much fun when we did it. That is, this is a practice that I like to include whenever we can be embodied together. And uh, it's a lot of silly fun um, and very approachable and very safe for, for most bodies to do. Uh, next, I would like to play a video from Kena Kastart. So she's a marriage and family therapist. She works primarily with women dealing with trauma. She's trauma-informed. And she also works with couples, doing couples therapy. And acro yoga was an important piece of how she arrived at becoming a marriage and family therapist. Uh, and then the second thing was the connection not to myself and the connection with other people, of course, but in a way that was like platonic, like this intimate connection that was super So thank you for people who let me know that they weren't able to hear Kena. Um, just briefly summarizing what she said was that she, before becoming a marriage and family therapist, she worked a lot on learning how to create boundaries with other people and clear communication with other people in practicing acro yoga and then has utilized what she learned through acro yoga in how she approaches her therapy uh, with couples, with sex therapy, and um, with her other private clients as well. So shifting gears, that, that kind of leads right into the um, psychological benefits of acro yoga. Um, and we'll hear from Kena one more time about how she's utilized acro yoga individually with clients who've experienced trauma, as well as a little bit more about how she has practiced with couples as well. I think that's a really important, valuable aspect, especially for somebody who's experienced abuse or, um, you know, any sort of, like, manipulation and, and uh, assault on their own body boundaries. That can be a really, really important, like, part of the Okay, because some people are having trouble hearing what she's saying. Uh, what she's talked about so far is how she um, has worked with women who have experienced trauma to um, reintroduce healthy touch and, and note that she is very clear about when she's wearing her psychotherapist hat versus when she's wearing her acro yoga teacher hat. They're, they're different. Um, people will actually seek her out for one or the other. So they're, they're, I will speak more to that soon. But um, one one approach that she has utilized is um, that talk therapy uh, is beneficial for some people. However, some people need a little bit more of an, an embodied approach. She calls it a, another portal of entry because for some people, talk therapy is great, and some people need are more experienced embodied that they they uh, need that. Um, safe ways in which to 
and lighthearted too. A lot of what uh, she utilizes are very lighthearted uh, ways of practicing after yoga together in which they talk that you might have more of a therapy session afterwards. But in the moment, it's, it's about exploring mindful movement more so than therapy after therapy after therapy after therapy. And if something arises in that mindful movement, then offering safe space to uh, discuss that. Um, she also does that similarly, I'll, uh, rather than since so many people can't hear the video, I'll just share what she says about her communication between couples. She, I, I hope I'm saying this correctly, but she tell, she uh, gives an example of how she's had people, a couple who are, are doing couples therapy together. And when they're sitting on the couch together, side by side, they're fine. Like, well, you know, there's stuff going on, but, uh, we're good. But then when they practice acro yoga together, uh, their default communication settings come in and you get things like, why is your foot in my low back? That hurts. As opposed to, could you move your foot away? Um, and uh, it kind of gives her a clear picture about why something as small as, honey, can you take out the trash can blow up? Because uh, there, there can be um, some things that pop up in an embodied way that don't pop up necessarily when people are talking on the, on the couch together. So for the sake of time, I'm going to go forward and make sure that we can kind of bridge the gap between psychological and spiritual as well. Um, and this quote from Bessel van, der, Bessel van der Kolk was so important that I put it in again. Um, and I have one other thing to share from him um, from the, uh, the Body Keeps score. And it's about cultivating a sense of autonomy and healing from trauma. Um, and in, in the book, he states that our brain disease model overlooks four fundamental truths. One, our capacity to destroy each other is matched by our capacity to heal one another. So trauma-informed yoga, for example, um, does a lot to create safe space. And I think just by suggesting the word trauma, sometimes it can be focused on the negativity, but not critiquing trauma-informed yoga at all, but I, I'm just saying that just as important in uh, healing from trauma is creating new, safe, joyful experiences as well. So restoring relationships and community is central to restoring well-being. Two, language. We've already spoken to that. Uh, Susan spoke to that. Language gives us the power to change ourselves and others by communicating our experiences, helping us to define what we know, and finding a common sense of meaning and communication is very key in acro yoga because you have to communicate where you are in space, what you would like from your partner or partners, what's going right, what's going wrong, um, in this very immediate way that afterwards you realize sometimes, oh, I was much more of a self-advocate than I normally am, say for example, or oh, I, I was very short, I want to go back and explore that. Um, also, we have the ability to regulate our own physiology, including some of the so-called involuntary functions of the body and brain that we explore in yoga therapy, such as breathing, moving, and I already span that out to touching, as, as Bessel, van der Kolk, uh, van der, Bessel van der Kolk says as well. And last, we can change social conditions to create environments in which children and adults can feel safe and thrive, and, and safe in where they thrive. When we ignore these quintessential dimensions of humanity, we deprive people of ways to heal from trauma and restore their autonomy and restore their ability to uh, have a sense of self. And when someone stays identifying as a patient rather than stepping forward into a more of a participatory role, um, it can leave people feeling alienated from an inner sense of self as opposed to uh, participating in creating and expressing that sense of self. So uh, I want I want to share um, a bit from. So I went and taught a partner yoga class at an eating disorder treatment center. Um, a lot of the women there had experienced trauma, um, and a lot of the women there were suffering also from body dysmorphia. And so in this talk, in this brief clip, Abby talks a little bit about um, that experience. Or simply, like, I think that the challenge was, challenges were um, having to acknowledge their body after eating, just being reminded that they had one. Um, so just because, again, some people can't hear well, 
she's acknowledging that uh, a lot of women with in this eating disorder treatment facility don't like have difficulty even acknowledge acknowledging that they are embodied have uh, difficulty acknowledging that they can possibly even feel comfortable in their body, especially after um, eating. And they had uh, recently had a more uh, challenging meal together. So a lot was coming up in this class. It was that they didn't want to have to fill their body after eating. And so this was asking them to do something that they weren't comfortable with, or maybe they just in general don't want to fill their body. Maybe they already feel like they're doing it all the time. And so this was even more taxing, you know. Um, then also the idea of physical boundaries, I think not just in terms of um, trauma, though there's that, uh, but in touch, you know, but physical boundaries in terms of like proprioceptive awareness and like with body dysmorphia, people feeling like their boundaries or their size are just, they're taking up more or less space than they might be or um, you know, just being very sensitive to that. And after so what she said there is that people with body dysmorphia often don't have a good sense of where they are in space or how much space they are taking up. And a practice like acro yoga can give them new information about um, whether that's accurate or not. Yoga, somebody else in your space and also like with hands on touching, like it's not your hand. So it kind of causes you to feel, I think, um, I think it caused clients to feel almost like their brain went, oh, wait, there's my body. Like, you know, sort of adjust their brain self in some way. Um, I'm totally uh, making assumptions. And, like, that's just how I would imagine it to be. Um, but also why I think it would be beneficial because so often – it's so skewed and then also um just communication having to talk to people that maybe they're normally comparing to actually working together um collaborating and uh letting so one thing that she mentions here also is that um a lot of times in eating disorder treatment women are comparing bodies and in this particular class that we were working with there were um bodies of all different shapes and sizes and there had been a lot of comparing going on among the, the 12 women that were in the class together. And it was really beneficial, some shared afterwards in illuminating that sense of other and comparison and instead uh, co-creating and collaborating together at first in a very hesitant way, but then eventually in a very joyful way. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to go forward. I would like to mention too that there, well, no, I, I won't mention that study, but um, so uh, I'll, I'm not to breeze through the spiritual, that's no light topic at all, but I do want to at least mention the aspect of collective flow and psychological flow is a state of absorption in a thought process or activity and the resulting enjoyment. So when you're absorbed, you're completely immersed in it. And then the en enjoyment isn't necessarily because it was fun per se, um, but it was, uh, creates the sense of meaning. And so when the idea behind collective flow is that when two people uh, take on a challenge, not a challenge that's too high or too low, too high, you're going to be anxious, too low, you're going to be bored. Um, with skills to equip to meet that challenge. Again, not skills that are super high and not skills that are boring sitting on the couch, but somewhere between those two is where you're more, more likely to find a state of flow. And when you find a state of flow together, a multi-sample study by um, uh, Walker, which I cite below, says that um, uh, reflects that when polled, people reported social flow being more enjoyable than flow experienced in solitary due to things like emotional contagion, mirror neurons. I could talk again about this all day long, but we're short on time. But uh, what some preliminary research has included or uh, indicated is that uh, a combination of uh, Small challenges and skills to meet those challenges are more likely to uh, offer a state of collective flow. And collective flow not being a state of 
necessarily pleasure, which meets like some sort of homeostatic need, but enjoyment, which offers uh, a sense of accomplishment and meaning as well. And so I won't share this, but emotional contagion, this is a video of uh, monks doing hop, playing hopscotch together in which you can really see the emotional contagion and joy happening, which is so lovely. Um, oh, yeah, there they go. But uh, for the sake of time, sorry to move so quickly. Um, Fell of the Anasara community out here. And, and so what Sarah talks about in this video, I'll summarize it real quick, is that uh, she shares her first experience of, of flying or of doing acro yoga and what she describes is absolutely a psycho-spiritual emotional firework show is how she describes it. Um, and so I want to propose going forward, taking a look at all of this to inform uh, acro yoga in a very mindful way, in a therapeutic way, as a, excuse me, as an adjunct to certain goals that might be, uh, some people might be working on in yoga therapy, whether they're physical, more in the biological sense, or social relationships, or other mental health issues, or spiritual, like how do I create meaning even in these little small ways? Um, so what I would like to end with is an opportunity to, an offering to create partnerships. I, I put scope of practice up here because it's important uh, thing that we discuss a lot in yoga therapy training is what disciplines can touch clients and what disciplines cannot touch clients. Acro yoga teachers, physical therapists, massage therapists absolutely can touch their clients. Yoga teachers, I looked it up on the, um, Yoga Alliance website, yoga teachers can utilize touch as long as they ask for consent every single time. And that's something that I believe deserves a little bit more dialogue in, in a group setting for sure, because that doesn't always happen, but that's another conversation. Um, cannot touch um, yoga therapists. We, if uh, we are working with a client in a yoga therapy context, it is not within the scope of practice to touch our clients. Same thing in counseling, whether you're a marriage and family therapist or otherwise, when you're working with a client in that capacity, it, there no touch. And so I think uh, what can be useful is to create partnerships or networks between these different healthcare providers um, so that we can meet what I think some people uh, could really benefit from. And so what I offer and what I, uh, plan to use this as a springboard for is three things. Educate, create, and honor. Educate uh, healing professionals through uh, creating some continuing education courses about how to consciously harness therapeutic elements of acro yoga to help profound benefits for clients. Create a database in which professionals who utilize therapeutic approaches to acro yoga or other modalities can connect with other healing professionals. And um, for those of us who are like, no, I have no interest whatsoever in practicing acro yoga, I, I honor that too, completely. But I do want to also honor, the, uh, like I said before, the effect that COVID-19 has had on everyone, everyone's physical, mental, and social well-being. And uh, A, eventually acro yoga will be safe to return to, but B, in the meantime, I hope that even just discussion about this as an adjunct to yoga and to yoga therapy can um, create some sense of healing and a kind of name it to tame it kind of way. And below are my sources and many uh, thanks and gratitude to the women who I interviewed. They, their interviews were fantastic. Um, and so I just want to end today. Thank you very, very much for listening to what I have to share. And if you ever have questions, comments, concerns about the intersection of yoga therapy and acro yoga or any of these other disciplines, I'm very excited to continue to build upon this and explore this more with other healing professionals. And I would um, welcome any and every dialogue and feedback. So thank you for your time. Many thanks everyone. And I thank you Jen for that illuminating talk. Um, we're so excited to see what you're going to continue to do with this and with what you shared with us. Uh, does anybody have any questions right now? Anybody want to raise their hand? Anybody? Not right now? 
Thank you, Jen. Wonderful job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Uh, oh, Chris has a question. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is in the chat and it is basically inquiring about is this a more attractive yoga for men in terms of uh, rate of participation? You know, it's really interesting. I have, I am going to be teaching a, well, as of right now, I'm slated to teach an acro yoga class at USC next semester. I think wow. we'll probably put that on hold due to COVID. But there are 19 slots, and everyone who has signed up is female, um, which I think is phenomenal. I'm so honored to work with these women. And I, I, you know, like I said, I have doubts that this will happen this coming semester. But I think that um, gender is definitely a big uh, thing that arises because there's definitely a, a stereotype of the base is the guy and the flyer is the female. And one thing that my training through acroyoga.org has emphasized is um, everybody participates in every single role. And so that does bring up a lot of, for a lot, for a lot of people around gender norms and who it's okay to lift up and who it's not okay to lift up. And I think that uh, it is very important to have dialogue about uh, when issues do arise surrounding um, gender and size and anything around that to uh, to bring it into the light and not let it uh, hinder the experience or impede um, conversation or have people shut down but I think that uh, it's an opportunity for dialogue for sure if that answers your question Chris yeah. <laughs> It, it reminds me that, and I know you didn't have time to get to it in this talk, but we've talked before about how it can help people build confidence. So for example, I remember um, when you're trying to teach me how to be a base and I, or even to fly, it's like, no, I can't do that. I don't, I don't have, I don't have that capacity. And then when you have the experience is recognizing it's actually, that was all mental and I, and well, it seems like it's such a physical practice. There's so much about our perspective, our perspective, our views of our what, who we are, our ability to co-regulate with another, and our ability to um, have the confidence that we need um, to show up in the world to do what we do. It's it's really got so many so many potential benefits. Mm, thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you.